Hi. <laughs> All right. All right. So um, without much further ado, I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen now. So here. All right. All right. What is social media? Um, so there's, you know, lots of definitions flying around, but essentially social media is a computer based technology that facilitates the sharing of ideas, thoughts, and information through the building of virtual networks and communities. So uh, there's lots of different subcategories and here you can also see kind of like a Western uh, uh, kind of grouping of different social media types, heavily dominated by Facebook that actually owns a lot of other social media uh, types that are pretty popular. But obviously there's much more and it's sort of like a changing ecosystem. So this diagram gets updated every, every year and you can sort of see how certain, um, anybody who's been following social media for a while knows that some platforms become incredibly popular and then uh, become less popular again. Um, and here's a Chinese uh, version of like sort of China's, Chinese social media, which you can see is a totally different uh, group of social media, um, but that kind of fulfills very similar functions. Um, I think what is important is that when we think of social media, social media we often only think of Facebook or only think of Instagram maybe, or these sort of very um, big uh, kind of sharing and networking platforms. But actually, um, even things like Spotify or Pinterest or any kind of platform where you can sort of uh, have your own input or, you know, add friends or add uh, other community members to, to your um, page are actually social media platforms. So for this class or lecture workshop, I want us to think of social media kind of in a wider sense. So not just, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of commonly used ones, but also sort of uh, blogs of social media. Actually Google Docs or Google Slides are absolutely social media. Um, so there is uh, essentially uh, uh, Wikipedia again, sort of like uh, uh, organized by you know by by a multitude of people and the ability to connect to others in the network. Um, or Slack is actually a work platform, um, but that has a chat function. That again, you know, you, you you're adding people into it. That it becomes sort of like a collective collective form. So it has many many different shapes, sizes, and forms, um, and it really is, you know, I think what uh, kind of for most, for a lot of people, I can say for me personally, is most of what I'm doing on the internet is in some kind of social media platform. Um, and that is especially because I think a lot of, a lot of my work actually is also online. So using sort of like formats like Google Docs and Google Slides is also replacing paper, replacing sort of traditional modes of working kind of on your own uh, in physical space. You're moving all, more, more and more of these things um, online into the virtual space in a kind of collective format. And again, uh, keep taking notes and maybe you have a different idea of what social media is. So, you know, uh, think about that and we can, I'm happy to argue that question or think if that's actually, um, maybe you want to have a tighter definition or maybe you think that certain things should not be considered social media. So uh, this is also just kind of a prompt for you to actually think about what, what social media means for you specifically. All right, uh, so here are a few examples of things that you might not immediately think of as social media, but I think are quite interesting. So this is a, um, a gallery space in Mozilla Hubs, which is actually, for those of you who are intro to architecture students, we'll be using that in intro as a tool to, um, want to just show you a little bit. But <laughs> uh, I just want to show you the uh, interface a little bit so you, uh, you can see me walking around a space right now on my desktop. And so this, this is actually done by the AA, and it's just an exhibition room where uh, you know you can you can essentially see um, different drawings. You can go up close, and it's it's uh, so the social aspect here is actually not not seen because the social aspect needs is that not the group can be locked in at the same time and they can also talk to each other. So it becomes, you know, uh, a platform that allows for 
socializing and for contributing content therefore also becomes social media automatically. Um, then another example here is um, uh, the SIARC end of year show. So the SIARC end of year show was um, a really fun kind of two, three hour um, intense live event that was happening on Twitch. And for those of you who don't know Twitch, Twitch is a live streaming platform for gamers. So people who, um, you know, essentially are really into showcasing. So that, that's kind of how it started, with people kind of showcasing live, live streams of their games and talking about it. So it's sort of very much optimized for that, but it also really worked super well for, for architecture actually. Here's uh, just a video of, of some of the content that was shown there. So a lot of it was sort of uh, uh, 3D live uh, uh, content that you could actually watch and importantly also engage in. So what made this a social platform was that there is on Twitch just uh, sort of multiple modification options in terms of you can you can add a chat, um, you can add um, members to certain kind of pages and you can, and there was even one page that had a collaborative um, 3D model where people were actually building a three-dimensional sculpture in Twitch. So um, again, you know, if they would have done that same um, presentation just on YouTube or on Zoom, it would have felt, uh, it would still qualify as social media in a sense, but um, Twitch sort of made it, the, you know, the format made it feel more gamified and more social, social in a sense, especially for people who are already kind of used to the platform. Um, and then, so these are all pretty recent examples because I think, you know, in the last few months when people were, um, uh, when, when schools had to rethink their end of year shows, uh, they had to kind of get really creative and start to work when, on different, with different methods. So here you see um, INDA, which is um, uh, another really interesting school that they actually uploaded their entire, um, their entire end of year show to Sansar, which is a 3D platform also kind of similar to Mozilla House, but even more advanced. And here you see a video of like the avatars, so the students walking around in their own end of year show in the three environments or sort of, uh, you know, socializing. So they're <laughs> pretty busy, busy team. Um, and, you know, the social aspect of it also disappears after a while. I mean, they, they were in there for a certain amount of time, but then um, after, uh, I went there later. I didn't actually. I missed the opening, and then I was in there all all by myself. So it sort of felt, it felt a little bit like the AA show that we just saw, where the social moment only exists for a very short amount of time. So again, you could question maybe the social media only for a certain amount of time, and now it's just an empty exhibition. But again, I'll I'll leave that uh, open to debate. Um, and there's been lots of online parties, like really fun events. Um, this is one called Club Cringe that has been really um, forward in terms of using 3D spaces and technology. And it was hosted on VR chat for a while and then moved to Second Life um, because of accessibility so more people could actually join. Um, but you know, uh, it's, it's quite, it is definitely a social experience. There was, uh, there was a um, uh, kind of 3D environment where people could walk around um, that was happening. And you see a sort of, they really built a custom atmosphere for, for these events. And at the same time, there was a Twitch stream and people were kind of chatting in the Twitch stream and the music was playing there. So it kind of combined two different platforms that were both designed for very specific users and made them into one successful hybrid. So this is, I guess, a meta social media um, a platform where things are, uh, uh, you know, used or hacked in a way that then becomes useful to, to that specific organization. And here you see something that is, you know, very, typical of social media platforms in 3D. You see people having avatars and really customizing their avatars. And again, as we will go into hubs in, um, with intro, you will also have avatars and be able to customize those. Um, maybe not as crazy as these, but you can, you can definitely make your own character. And then, you know, Zoom. I mean, Zoom obviously is used for work, lectures, all these things, but it also is actually used uh, for parties, and what I found really interesting here is that 
you know, uh, uh, as a mode of engagement, people really wait for hours until they have their three seconds and they're on and they're dancing or they're performing. So there's definitely something here in terms of like thinking about how social media really works because you also get the spotlight or you have, there's a moment when you are able to um, actually, you know, perform for everybody else. Otherwise, the whole thing wouldn't really make any sense. So this is a kind of an interesting takeaway from watching these events unfold. Um, and here another example, uh, club quarantine um, that kind of had a constant kind of ticker of seeing how many people are in there. So you also have a, even just this, this number, right? If that wouldn't be here, you would just go onto a website maybe and think, oh, I'm just listening to this music, I'm kind of by myself. But this number alone can, can bring the social into media or kind of like can make you feel connected to, you know, 1,834 other people who are actually enjoying that same music at the same time. So there's this life aspect um, is really, really important here. Um, so, you know, talking about activism and social media. So, um, I mean, uh, all of you have, have heard of George Floyd and probably most of you have seen the video. I think that was, you know, uh, social media at its most extreme in, uh, in terms of activism or in terms of not activism necessarily, but in terms of uh, a short clip going viral and having a huge, huge effect. Um, and I found this quote by Omar Vaso, who's um, is part of an interview, and he's he's a professor at Princeton, kind of studying uh, social media and activism. And what he said is, part of what social media does is allow us to see a reality that has been entirely visible to some people and invisible to others. As those injustices become visible, meaningful change follows. So that was specifically in reference to George Floyd, but I think it's true for a lot of different ways that social media has been used um, in an activist way. So it's really about, you know, making things visible, as simple as that. And so um, here's some examples. So very recently, um, there's uh, a list came out and on, on Google Sheets. And again, Google Sheets is also social media, right? Like everybody can contribute. You can see uh, what other people are doing in it. I've heard recently of a party that happened on Google Slides, but here's also, or Google Docs actually, and people came in and like edited stuff. So this is uh, a, you know, uh, a, a sort of political use where people are saying, okay, we, um, um, BIPOC or BIPOC, I'm not sure actually how to pronounce it yet, but th those studios um, uh, are, you know, studios of people of color um, are, underrepresented in architecture. There, there's so many of them. There's literally, I think this list, I'm not sure exactly how far it goes, but it's, it's a long one. You can scroll down and it's a long list. Um, so just the act of making this list collectively and putting that online is, um, you know, you could call it social media activism in a sense, and it's sort of a way for people to bring out the invisible, bring out something that that hasn't been sort of seen and noted before. And I've heard from friends that that list had an actual effect. It got more applications um, um, and, you know, feel seen. So it's, it's, it's an important uh, tool or way to kind of showcase, uh, showcase certain practices. And then uh, similarly, that was about two years ago, um, the Shady Architecture Man list came out, which was also a crowdsourced list and, uh, uh, you know, essentially exposed uh, men who had treated women in, in however the women felt unfair. So it was, it, 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 you know, the, the, the list ranged from subtle situations to very extreme cases of abuse, but the point was that everybody was able to un anonymously write down what they had experienced and kind of expose these people uh, in a very public way. So again, uh, uh, you know, another way of exposure or another way of making the invisible visible. Um, and very recently we've seen a lot of people taking, using social media to take a stance or to take a position. So here is a quote by Leong Leong that, um, you know, when Black Lives Matter was really kind of uh, uh, sort of at its peak in terms of the protest a couple of weeks ago, they, they posted simple statement just saying that they stand in solidarity um, and uh, uh, that they, you know, uh, support the movement, but also very importantly, they, 
they said, as architects, we publicly acknowledge that no building is ever more valuable than human beings' lives, which is a very, very strong statement. Um, and then I think what is interesting in terms of, and we'll get to, to you know, the six P's, the, the reason some, a post is successful goes viral. At the end, they kind of give people a way, kind of action points or something, they, they, they suggest something that they had done. So they donated to certain organizations and they're, they're urging um, people to donate or to speak up or to do something. So that's kind of like a call to action here at the end of the post. Um, that makes it very effective. So it's sort of, you know, having a statement, kind of like kind of broadcasting your own opinion, but then also uh, asking asking people to do something about it. So, um, you know, there's been many, many different reactions and a lot of them have also been heavily criticized and it sort of uh, felt like a very difficult time for people to actually communicate publicly. And that's also something I wanna talk about in the discussions to think about that have you ever you know, thought like thought about what to post, or is it the right time to post, or did it feel inappropriate? So, I think that that um, uh, this is, for example, an, an, an example of something that that went really well. And here, another example, very recently, a few days ago, a friend of mine actually um, posted this this uh, accusation, really, of uh, that that the Met um, Metropolitan Museum in New York had treated her. Uh, unfairly and based on on racial bias and and you know that post is just people have shared it and that post just went went uh, viral and the Met actually then published that they will take action so it was actually a really really successful viral activist post I would say that that you know exposed a condition something that actually she had talked to me about years ago um, that was an injustice that was done to her and through social media she was able to actually finally draw attention to it in a way that made it so strong that the Met couldn't ignore it anymore that you know this is very and the Met is like such a powerful institution powerful institution so like to, to to sort of talk about the Met in such a public way and getting this attention is is, is really powerful um, and then memes. <laughs> so memes as activism, uh, you know, are, are, I would say, exploding on the internet right now. There are so many different pages and um, uh, uh, kind of growing every day and, and uh, seeing new things. It's, uh, it's really, I would say, if, you, if you're looking for a new way to be creative in architecture, <laughs> start a meme page with a few friends and, and just publish it. It's, it's, it's a really, fun endeavor and um, what I would say is, you know, uh, as with everything, there's just so much nuance and different, uh, you kind of have to follow a page for a while to really understand their political uh, direction and orientation because memes are often not necessarily super direct, but I, sometimes they're ironic, you know, or sometimes, and so people often misunderstand memes. It's really fun to read through all the different comments, but I think, uh, when you're an architect and you start following these architecture pages, you you'll start to understand these various references to things. And actually, um, you know, for example, uh, complexity and contradiction in architecture is a very famous book. Um, and so you have to kind of understand that reference in, all, in order to understand the meme fully. I mean, you probably understand a little bit without knowing the book, but it really just becomes funny to that community, to that subculture that is the architectural community here. So. Um, you know, it's, 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 yeah. And here, you know, here are rhino jokes. So for those of you who haven't used rhino yet, these are, <laughs> I guess, explaining the meme, but these are funny because it's essentially like taking a political statement, but then using the rhino interface as like it's framing, right? So, so sort of mis, not misusing, but sort of like uh, subverting the, the idea of rhino is a, a neutral tool that you just use to make designs. It's, it's actually sort of, uh, here, here used in a, in a, in a critical way. Um, and then, so this is the Uber meme and I'm actually, so, uh, I'm curious if anybody, no, I'm sure some, I'm sure a lot of you know, but like, uh, maybe some of you don't know which one is the original one, but that's why I, I on purpose made this page a little bit confusing. Uh, and this is actually an analog meme. So it sort of started uh, it was written, it was made in the 60s um, 
by Bob Venturi and Dennis Scott Brown uh, in uh, Learning from Las Vegas. So they, it's a very famous architecture book again, same, same authors as this book. And uh, what, they, what they were essentially saying um, is that there's two types of architecture, the decorated shed um, versus the duck. And, and so this, this meme was sort of like became this very famous icon of the decorated shed. Um, I won't go into it because the, the, it basically just means the box that has like a big sign on top, really what the meme is, or that sort of signifies to the outside what it does through signage and not through its shape. Uh, and so, but what's awesome about this is, you know, so I'll give it away for, for those of you who, who haven't seen this before. Uh, okay, think, think a second and choose which one you would pick as the original, but Okay, so this one is the original, I'm a monument. Um, and all the other ones on this page are, you know, memes or so they're, they're copies. They're, they're kind of like versions that people have made. And this is really what makes a successful meme is sort of not just that it's funny, but it allows people to kind of engage with it and replicate it or just sort of uh, 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 put their own imprint onto it or their own ideas onto it. Um, so here you see a protester recently, probably an architect, I'm assuming, uh, who you know, took, that, took that picture uh, or took that, that drawing and sort of adjusted it uh, for, his own, for his own purposes. Uh, and here you see, you know, this again is sort of like an inside architecture joke. I was mentioning that the, the duck is another sort of trope from that same book. And so it's sort of turning that duck into the decorated shed. It's sort of like a hybrid. A hybrid version of a joke, um, but yeah. Anyway, it's 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 a it's a classic, um, and also showing that memes are not actually something that is necessarily digital. It, that they haven't existed pre, uh, you know, pre digital era, and so it's just something that uh, now I think has, um, in in a sense, in that particular format of like text and image become great importance because it's so easily shareable on the internet. But memes are sort of like, um, uh, you know, little pieces of information uh, uh, or sort of discrete ideas that can be replicated actually have a much larger history. Um, here, just another example of a really popular meme account by Ryan Kavnitsky. He, uh, you know, he's really like the, the number one memester, I guess, of his generation and get interviewed for it and in, in, in architecture very specifically. And here's just some, some of my favorite memes. Um, we actually did an exhibition that featured some of his memes a few years ago that was called Meme GIFs and Lo-Fi Drawings uh, here in New York. And those are just some examples. Um, so Joshua Citarella is a, a New York artist who extensively wrote about memes and political culture as well. Uh, this is another one of these things that I re recommend as a reading uh, if you want to get deeper into sort of, you know, how memes are used in, the, in a political sense. Um, uh, the, the particular essay is called Politogram in the Post Left and he sort of analyzes how meme culture actually helps or sort of amplifies people's extreme political positions to kind of drive them into like even more extreme niche, niche, niche places. So here's some screenshots of sort of popular meme pages that just uh, create a sort of like fantastical positions that basically are parties of one where kind of one person just uh, sort of narrows it into one particular position and then through memes and through kind of internet culture, social media culture uh, propagates their information and they become sort of pages for debate, for shit posting, for sort of, you know, various ways of, of, of expression that is very, very particular to to that group, but also has a larger influence in society where people start to, um, you know, follow these pages and get influenced by them. So it's sort of, yeah, uh, just notes for, for the reading if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, all right, so we're getting to the next chapter. So now if you've been sort of, uh, 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 you know, vaguely paying attention, I think if you're, if you, if you're, if you have any ambition to be, um, uh, a social media superstar or a memester or uh, Instagram celebrity in architecture, now, now is the moment to listen. <laughs> and even if you don't, if you just want to use it, you know, uh, for your own uh, practice or to share your own work, I think it's just interesting, interesting things to know. So the number one things that 
And this is all after um, so Limor Schiffman wrote this excellent book, Memes in Digital Culture. And so she kind of unpacked, she analyzed um, hundreds and thousands of samples, and this is sort of like her analysis of what makes a post go viral or popular. Um, and the number one aspect is positivity and humor. So uh, essentially, people like sharing positive things because then some, you know, they want to be funny, they want their friends to think they're funny. Um, so it's not necessarily just positive, it can also be something that is in itself positive, but it, that has humor in it. So 90% of viral advertisements um, by professional companies include humorous elements. So it's really a big factor in terms of like how people are sharing something is that it has some kind of level of funniness or irony. That's why you see so many ironic posts also because even when people are making, you know, a serious statement, there's often like a hint of irony in that post. Another thing is provoking high arousal emotions. So this is what we've seen a lot and this is kind of some of the activist posts that I showed earlier, sort of like uh, posts that make people angry, essentially. So it's not so much posts that make people sad, because when people get sad, they don't, they don't feel so motivated to repost. It's more when you feel angry and you also feel like there's an actionable item, aka resharing, reposting, re-editing, that, uh, that actually, you know, leads to this kind of viral, viral content. So if you have something, a real issue, and you show a very clear way that it can be um, shared, that's that's another good way to uh, to engage with your audience. And then, uh, so packaging, uh, simple uh, 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 sort of how does it look like or how does it sort of translate. The most important thing here is that uh, your, the content needs to be clear and simple. So anything that, you know, we have a lot of other media for complex long-winded long -winded ideas, there's books, movies, all their stuff, but when you're creating viral content, the message needs to become distilled down to one idea because by definition, you know, uh, these media are very quick and so people have to understand it very quickly and be, can be, it needs to be very, very clear in order for people to, to get it. So clear and simple is just a kind of prerequisite for things. Another one obviously is, so it's got, you know, it's called prestigious. If somebody's already famous or has a lot of followers, that will help. Um, but, you know, that's not something you can always uh, influence. Uh, but what you can influence is positioning. So seeding strategy is simply like, uh, uh, so one, one, one important aspect of positioning that uh, all of us can control is timing. Um, what time of the day you post, what time of the week even. And also, you know, being aware of what's going on in the world and not posting when something really big happens in the news or response. I think there's sort of a lot of, uh, a lot of knowledge in terms of like posting at the right time. Um, which I think is part of positioning, but then also seeding. So sort of like either talking to people who have lots of um, lots of followers to kind of repost it. So there's hubs and bridges. Hubs are people who just have lots of followers, and bridges are people who bridge to some other group that is not connected to your social group. So um, those are sort of important seeding uh, mechanism or strategies. And then finally, uh, participation. So again, this idea that you know um, people can engage with your content in some way. Um, so either through resharing it through um, some kind of call to action, uh, something where they feel that it isn't just something they're consuming, but they can sort of uh, share it or bring it forward. So these are the six P's. I mean, again, very sort of broadly and. Um, and not not every successful post has all the piece at all. It's like uh, you know, uh, some of them only have one or two, but most of the really successful ones have at least like three or four of these um, of these characteristics. Um, just because that's that's what really helps with with spreading that news. Um, so from that, I want to you know I want you to keep these in mind a little bit. And I see that people are not really posting any questions or comments, so just encourage you to, to to post it on the on the group chat just just so that we kind of have some discussion points um, at the end. So be the first one who can do it. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna show a few specifically architectural examples of you know successful online content. Uh, in this case actually a few different GIFs. 
that have uh, an element of humor surprise in it. You know, like, like, like the guy who kind of walks in and the, the painting that was previously still all of a sudden runs away. Um, uh, or, um, you know, this, this sort of still image that all of a sudden these curtains are, are moving. So sort of an element of, uh, of surprise is here. Definitely present. And then here another, those are just uh, some beautiful architecture shifts that, that, um, that are also part of that exhibition that I mentioned earlier that I wanted to show you as references of sort of like making kind of funny and kind of like effective social media. So here you have these jumping windows, right? And you can sort of see the, the shadow behind, which is also uh, nice, you know, that you can use it becomes like um, uh, uh, some, some kind of like animated facade the way you, you really see it. Or here you have a floor plan that just falls apart. Um, and here's some, some more examples by uh, Fufu or Paula Villaplana with her partner, um, you know, making GIFs. Uh, one very typical thing is GIFs that kind of rotate infinitely or kind of like have a loop going on where sort of one object or an element keeps looping so that it sort of visually uh, keeps going forever. And, uh, or here we have kind of still the image and only like a small aspect of the image moving to kind of draw attention. And movement, so that's something I maybe add to Linnerworth's uh, six sort of categories. This is something specific, uh, specific I think in architecture and also specific to web culture. Uh, as architects, they're very, very much used to drawing uh, on paper, right, and printing things on paper and kind of having a kind of print in mind. But when you're creating content for the internet, it's actually really good to incorporate movement. It just draws your eye. It makes it, it often can tell a story about your about your scene or about your interior or, or your your facade or whatever you're, you're drawing. So, you know, here you can sort of see the steam coming out of these things. So you kind of have a totally different idea of what this would be um, if it wouldn't be a still image. And it's also a really really good way to show three dimensionality. I mean, even even you know in these these spaces, they feel really activated because there's a flight movement. Here's just sort of uh, some tools that, um, you know, are, I like to use, and it's kind of like a very personal list. It's by no means complete. I mean, there's way more, but uh, these are some, some tools that I find quite useful in terms of sharing content, in terms of um, uh, producing, uh, you know, architectural content specifically. So maybe the most interesting part here for you guys is the 3D tools section um, that includes uh, VR chat and Sansar, which Second Life, which are all 3D social platforms. So the examples we saw really early on from the parties and from people, the schools uploading the end of year shows are all living in that kind of space. And we will be using that in Mozilla Hubs. Um, and then Sketchfab is a really powerful platform to upload 3D models to the web. Um, and I'll show you that in a minute how that how that works because Sketchfab is really great because it allows you to use that 3D content in many different ways. You can use it for AR, uh, um, for AR or VR, and you can also use it, um, sorry, augmented reality is AR and VR is um, virtual reality, just, just to clarify. Um, but the, um, uh, but it also allows you to embed the content on websites, um, send people link to that content and so on. Um, and so I want to end this lecture with another theorist. So Michael Connor is, um, I think the head, one of the head curator or the head of Rhizome, which is sort of a organization concerned with the internet and archiving the internet. And I just want to highlight this one quote, which is digital culture is more about practices than objects. Um, so what does that mean? I think, you know, there's all these definitions, but I think in the end, it's a way of practicing or, um, and a way of sharing that is kind of specific to the internet. So that's really just the main point of this lecture is that when you're creating for the internet, you are kind of entering a large, you're entering a network and you're entering a discussion with many other people when you're, when you're on social media and you're also, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of, 
allowing co-creation automatically because you're sharing. And so uh, I think that as a sort of uh, uh, practice is, is important to kind of distinguish from uh, traditional print-based practice in architecture. And that's just something where you also can take a position. You can also say, that's not for me. I prefer, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a paper person only. Um, and this is not the way that I want to engage with architecture. Or you're saying, actually, I want to become an activist and make the most viral post that, you know, will make my cause, uh, uh, that will hi highlight my cause or change something in the world. Or, I mean, there's, there's many different positions and practices that can be taken within, within social media. Um, and here in this essay, uh, he's talking specifically about exhibitions, but I think it, it applies to social media and sort of architectural production as well. Um, so what he's saying, um, online exhibitions do not take place in a unified coherent space. So when you're creating something, it doesn't mean that it will look like that in somebody else's screen, right? They have a different size. So it's an important thing to remember that everything will be transformed. The poor image will uh, uh, arrive potentially because of network, you know, maybe the audio quality uh, isn't that great in that lecture. I mean, I have no control over how you are receiving that content. So um, uh, that's kind of what he say, says about online exhibitions involve arranging a multifaceted mise-en-scene to accommodate an unfolding event, which is literally what we're doing right now. Right, we're sort of creating a mise en scène, a sort of scene, um, but that is unfolding live. But we don't really know how, where it goes, and how it arrives. Um, and then finally, relations, exhibitions as a whole are social processes. Again, you can say the same thing about architecture, publishing in a sense, and online exhibitions are social processes that play out via computer networks. So again, full loop back to the definition of what what social media is. It is a social process that plays out in a network.